Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunday Forum today. Today, we are welcoming uh, Warren uh, Saylor. Is that right? Correct. Welcome. He is joining us from the Spokane Tribe of Indians today to speak to us about the practice of land acknowledgement. Um, I had my first exposure to this when I was living in Alaska. And I think honestly, the first time I really paid it was sort of you know, paying attention. I went to a, a play or a musical at the Civic Center and we started our time together uh, that way. Um, it's something that just sort of crops up and uh, appears in different places and times but maybe some of us haven't really been exposed to a conversation about what is this practice and what is going on and why are we doing this? Um, and uh, for example, yesterday we had uh, our Synod Assembly and our time together as a Synod began with an invocation of the Triune God uh, and then uh, the Bishop acknowledged the land on which we were gathered on. Uh, and um, who has stewarded this land over its history. Uh, also in connection, sort of Thursday was Earth Day. We thought that this would be an appropriate way to dovetail. Uh, if you uh, joined us for worship this morning, you might have noticed that worship was uh, sprinkled in with uh, themes of stewardship and care for creation. So this is dovetailing with us today. We are very blessed to have Warren with us. Thank you so much. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to him. Thank you so much. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank thank you for the invite, and we'll see if we can see what we can get done today as far as addressing land acknowledgement. Um, but in doing that, uh, we're also going to uh, look at a, a little bit about the history of the tribe, because I don't think you can really identify about who was here first, taking care of the land, uh, that connection between uh, people in the land and people in the plants and the animals without also talking a little bit about the history. Um, and, but if I start wandering off, um, Edwin, uh, just let me know. Um, I am, I, I'm really into history, uh, but also, and don't hold it against me, I'm a former tribal politician, so uh, I might wander from time to time and feel free to, to rein me back in. Um, so we, I do have created a PowerPoint, kind of facilitate the discussion, that way you're not just having to look at me throughout this whole thing. But I think it'll, it'll help the conversation. Because um, uh, my name is Warren Saylor and I work for the Spokane Tribe of Indians, but I work out of what I mostly do is history presentations around the region. But my office is based out of the Department of Natural Resources. So I think that's why they kind of called upon me because of Earth Day and, and natural resources and that type of thing, combined with, with the history stuff that I do. And so I'm going to uh, turn on a, the, my PowerPoint to see if I can get it started here. So just bear with me just for a second. And so, I, so is it up on your and everyone's screen? Okay. And I apologize, I'm not the greatest at Zoom. Um, so if you do have questions as I go through this, please just throw it in chat or I really don't mind if you, if you just turn on your mic um, to ask that question either. It, it, we'll just see how it goes and, and play it by ear. So today's presentation is uh, about the Spokane Tribe of Indians and land acknowledgement. And for the Spokane tribe, it's the, the uh, people that were here on this land first. Um, we do, we're gonna touch base a little bit of some of our stories that have been passed down from generation to generation, how we arrived here first and when we arrived here first. And, but also we're gonna touch a little bit of connection being you're a, a church and related group. I think we're gonna touch a little bit on that aspect also and that in that connection between the tribe and our history with with several of the of the churches um, just to kind of do a, a brief uh, introduction the 
Spokane tribe is, is a federally recognized tribe. Uh, we officially became a recognized tribe in, in 1951. Prior to that, we were under our old chief system. And in 1951, what occurred was the United States told tribes across the nation that this is your one and only opportunity to file a lawsuit against the United States to get compensation for some of your lost lands. And you know, some of this was maybe the one, most famous one that still exists is, is the one over the Black Hills. But the Spokane tribe also filed for about 3 million acres. That's, that was the Aboriginal territory or amount of acreage that the Spokane tribe mostly lived on. We did venture out past those areas, but the, the primary area for the upper middle and lower Spokane's was about 3 million acres. 1951, we created our own constitution and that was mandated if we wanted to file a lawsuit. Um, so we do have a form of government that, that was mandated to look similar to that of the United States. So we, we worked on and passed the constitution at that time. We are a membership. Today's membership is just under 3000 members, tribal members. Our government is based on a five man tribal council or five person tribal council. Um, they each have three year staggered terms. We have a executive director that overlooks all of the programs, uh, all of the administrative department, natural resources, health and human services and other government uh, offices. We also have a business arm. These are like our Spokos and our Two Rivers Marina and, and those types of businesses, uh, which we have to have because we don't have a tax base. We do receive a, a, some portion of money from the federal government due to the, some of their, as the federal government is our trustee. So some of those were made in the promises of the tribes that had treaties and other types of things. Um, but a lot of our uh, funding has to come from business development. And if we wanna expand our elder programs or our child programs or our protective services, those types of things, we fund our own ambulance and police. Like I said, we just don't have a tax base. So we have to, our tribal council and our business enterprises have to create that added revenue. And then more, most recently, the, the biggest part is, is um, and I know it's, it's, uh, it's our biggest gen money generator, but, it, but it's probably not the, the, it's the difficult one to chat with, uh, with a Christian group uh, because it is gambling and it is gaming, but but that's our biggest source of revenue right now. Um, without it, you know, people would really be struggling. Okay, we'll begin with kind of the history portion before we jump into the land acknowledgement. Um, if we take nothing else away from today, yes. just remember that that the Spokane tribe is a a river people. For thousands, ten thousand years or more, we were a river people. But we were also semi-nomadic. I mean, just about this time of year, we would start venturing off into other parts of the region to where the white camas was, the brown camas, the carrot, the onion, and, and those types of foods. Um, and then we had that seasonal pattern and return to our ceremonial camp or our winter camp after we did that hunting, fishing, and gathering for about four or five months to get make it through winter. Now this, I know this, this isn't from the South Hill. This South Hill is on the right side of this photo. This is actually at Palisades Park, which is a, a wonderful view of the city. Um, but everything you see in this picture up to the foothills of those mountains far in the background would, was the land of the upper Spokane's. Then farther you had lower and the middle Spokane's, but this is the upper Spokane's. Chiefs like Chief Gary, Chief Enoch, Chief Lewis, Chief Paul, Chief Bell, those chiefs would have been in the, somewhere along the river, this river valley in here. Now, St. Mark's would be um, up just uh, off the photo of on the right side. Um, and I apologize, I should have went to the South Hill and took the picture from the other way. I'm not sure if the view would have been the same, but um, 
it, it just make, is a nice story from here. Now, just if we would pan to the left is Mount Spokane. Again, everything at the from the Mount Spokane to where we are at and then and then south and, and west is additional lands of the Spokane tribe. And so from Mount Spokane, everything here is Spokane. Now on the far side, on the back side of this would be the Kalispell and Ponderé tribes. Everything from the foothills to the right would have been the Coeur d'Alene's. And things from the foothills to the left would have been the Chuila and the Colville tribal areas. So this mountain is kind of a center point or a tripod of, of tribes. Now, when you talked about land acknowledgement, um, to us, it's, it's, it's growing also. People are finally trying to recognize history for what it was. For so many years, history was hidden, especially the tribal hid history, because in my opinion, nobody wanted to talk about the, the genocide. Nobody wanted to talk about the, the um, bad as uh, aspects or the horrific treatment of tribal people. And because when you talk about history of this continent, that's, that's what it is. Um, so when, when the city of Spokane, most recently in the newspaper and, and Eastern Washington University and Gonzaga and Whitworth and a lot of the other entities started wanting to do land acknowledgements in opening up some of their major meetings, the tribe has been working with a lot of those organizations to do that. And, you know, it sounds like you have one. And I just threw these three short little paragraphs together to kind of give an example of, of what I would say. But it's the importance of, of uh, acknowledgement is as important to, to me as history itself. You know, where would, where would any church be without understanding its history? You know, and, and, and land acknowledgement is, is a part of identifying that the people here first and their histories that, that went along between that connection between, between human beings and the land. Now, just kind of give you a, a broader sense, brush stroke of the tribe. Uh, actually, before I do that, I'm going to, uh, are there any questions at this point or any comments or? Um, going once, going twice. Did you have something, Edwin? Not no? yet. I was just going to say, I haven't seen any uh, pop in okay. the chat. Okay, so so kind of give you a perspective of where the Spokane tribe sits amongst the other Salish speakers. Now on this map is where the Salish language is. And so the, the Spokane and Spokane tribe is kind of on the lower part of that. And as you can see, uh, our language goes all the way up into Canada. About 50% of our language is in Canada and 50% is, you know, when they drew that line between uh, the British and, and America that, and you might've seen, I think it was two or three days ago, you might've seen in the spokesman where the Synax uh, people of the Kaval tribe actually won a court case in Canada, identifying that they're not extinct. You know, it was, it was all about, it was all about hunting. Um, well, that's what brought it about is, is when Larry Dizatel went up and, and shot an elk and, just to make this court case go forward. But this kind of gives you an idea. And so that the Salish speakers are like the uh, Ponderé and the Bitterroot Salish of the Flathead Reservation. Um, and there's, there's stories that goes along why the Salish speakers are like this. And so if the Flathead story says at one time we were all one group, and then when we started moving out and disbanded, we became the Spokane and Kalispells and Coeur d'Alene's and Shushwap and Okanagan and Sandpoils. And that's how the language spread across this part of the country. Now the Spokane has a similar story. And I, I think I'll save that for, for a little bit later. Now this is kind of our Aboriginal territory. As you can see the city of Spokane on the, in the pink on the right side of the photo in the lighter, greenish yellow that's today's current reservation 
Um, we're much more fortunate than a lot of tribes, especially back east in the south, because we're actually still hold on to some of our Aboriginal territory, our ancestral grounds, where some were, re were removed from their lands, we weren't. Um, to some extent, you know, that, and, and because of our leaders, we still own about 95% of that original reservation, where some of the tribes, they may own 10%. Or they're so checkerboarded you can't tell where the reservation begins and where it ends. You know, at least I can say that much for the tribe that we hold on to that part of it. Now, for the tribe itself, a lot of our information was passed down through through word of mouth, oral history, or oral storytelling. Now we do have uh, stories of how the land was formed. Because that's, you know, for, for this one, land formations were put into coyote stories to help tell why they look the way they do. Now, now this one I put on there, it's called Coyote and the Salmon. And it talks about the, riv the Spokane River drainage and how, why the Spokanes have had salmon, but the Coeur d'Alene's didn't. And it's all about a wife. Well, we gave him a wife and, and they didn't. So he built Spokane Falls. And, the, and then the fish couldn't get to the Coeur d'Alene's because of the falls. And also there, if you looked at some of the old maps in the, of the city, there was actually a waterway that went to the south of, of the falls. And so Coyote was digging that waterway. And when they, he didn't receive the salmon, that's when he stopped. And so that's why it never got finished. But there was a, there's other stories. Now this is the Spokane Reservation. Uh, this is probably our, our most important chief. Uh, he he is the one that signed and agreed to a reservation. He sent a letter a letter in 1880 accepting the terms of the reservations. Now if it wasn't for this chief and the sending of that letter, the Spokane tribe today its people would have been scattered we would probably be known as either Flathead, Bitterroot Salish in, in the Pondre, or Coeur d'Alene, or Colville's. Uh, and, but as he did that letter and accepted it, we actually be, had a uh, Spokane reservation, at least for the lower Spokanes accepted to us. But because of that, when it, that occurred, the upper and middle Spokanes did not go to the reservation and they remained in the city of Spokane. And they held on to that belief they weren't going to leave the city of Spokane where their grandfathers and their great great grandfathers were buried. You know, they, they held on as long as they could. So the, the United States came back in 1887 and forced them to move. Now they, they had a choice. Either you have to go to the Jocko, which is the Flathead Reservation, the Colville or the Coeur d'Alene. Initially, they were not even given the option to come to the Spokane Reservation with the Lower Spokanes. And so that's why a lot of Spokanes are, that became Colville, became Coeur d'Alene, and became Jocko or Flathead Reservation residents, and are now members of those tribes. And so we were scattered. And so a full brother may be Spokane, and a full sister may be Coeur d'Alene, or maybe Flathead, or maybe Colville. And so today, a lot of those extended families live on those other reservations. Now, now being we were talking about land, I, I threw in going back farther in time. Um, as you probably know, the about the the Missoula flood theory or the Spokane flood theory. You know, there were two great lakes at the break of the ice age. Now this was theorized by J. Harlan Bretz in, in the 1920s and then became more accepted around 1950, 1960. But we actually have a tribal story that, that aligns with this. And the tribal story, it's my belief that J. Harlan Bretz heard the tribal telling of the story in 1910 when it was read to the uh, Historic Society of Spokane and then followed that story and come up with his theory in 1920. And it just talks about, so like on this Spokane River banks where those erosion, mar oops, erosion marks are on the, the bank, 
Well, those are the same erosion marks you can find around in Montana and other parts of the, of the Palouse. So the, the one you're looking at on the top right, that's in Missoula. The same lines that you saw in the riverbank. And then the two on the top right and the bottom, those are going towards Palouse as those waters left and vacated carved out our landscape. And so our story actually matches up with that. And I probably don't have time to tell a lot story, um, but at some point in time, if you wanna see it or hear it, I, I can do that. But it talks about how we came to the city of Spokane. We followed the receding waters and ended up at Spokane Falls. And this is Spokane Falls that we knew before the other people started arriving. And, and so this is, this is Riverfront Park in 1880 before the, the big flood of people started coming in. This is what made, when below this is where the major fishing began. And so the size of fish that used to come to the city of Spokane were, were upwards of 30 and 40, some 50 pounds. These are actually some of the biggest fish in, in the Northwest. Um, they were called June hogs is what, oh, what they, they titled them. Um, and so when we say there were, we live from, what the river gave us. Now, when, when you see this fish this size coming in the thousands and thousands and thousands, and the early fur traders and the botanists and the missionaries, they would, they would hear terms like you could walk across their backs to the other side because the river was so full of, full of these fish, or it was black with fish, or it was red with fish, depending on the species that was coming up. Now, this is, this is, um, our first introduction to uh, the Bible came from the first that arrived here. Now, this is Chief Spokane Gary, probably the uh, most written about and most well-known of Spokanes. He was born in 1811, a year after the fur traders arrived. Uh, he was sent away at the age of 14 to the Red River to learn about English and French and the Bible and about farming. Now, his father sent him away because his father understood that there was many more people coming. That's what our, the prophecies were. We understood that already. And that's the prophecies is actually why we accepted them. Because a lot of people say, well, why didn't you just kill them when they arrived? Why did you welcome them in? Well, we wanted them here. One, there was these diseases that were going on. And we thought, because we had a lot of people dying prior to that, we had lost about 75% of our people because of disease, tuber uh, smallpox and whooping cough and these European diseases. So we had lost 75% of our people. And so we thought these new people of the land would bring us that cure. They might know what this is and help us with it. So then in 1825, Chief Gary, or Spokane Gary, actually it was, his name was Slow Kicha at that time, went to the Red River, which is about 1,500 miles away, sent by his father, learn all you can, come back, and then teach the rest. He returned in 19, 1830, excuse me, and he began, and he began with the Bible. His first teachings were that of the Bible. Now, we absorbed the Bible and the teachings in, in those ways very easily, or we accepted it very easily. And a lot of people wonder why, but, but it's pretty simple. To, to, one, it was in the prophecies for my grandmother, who was a Coeur d'Alene, their prophecy, Circle and Raven, a hundred years before the first priest even arrived, um, told of a man in a black robe wearing cross sticks going to arrive and you, you learn, he'll help you into the future. Now the Spokane version is a little bit different from uh, Big Head and Cornelius. That prophecy was, was they'll be carrying talking leaves. The talking leaves to us is the Bible. And, and so these two different prophecies came true. And so, but we were able to accept them because it was saying the same way we were already living. The way we believed is there was one creator that created everything. Um, you don't, one of our beliefs is you do just do not talk ill of others or you don't take creator's name in vain. Uh, you honor your elders. 
you do not kill, you do not steal, you're an honest person. The fur traders would say, if I, I feel more comfortable in amongst the Spokane's and my own people, because as an example, if I drop a dollar coin amongst the Spokane's, I'm sure to get it back. Amongst my own people, that's probably not going to happen. The tribal people were honest. This was part of the culture and punished if you weren't or you were, were ridiculed if you weren't. Um, we were a we, our culture was sharing and giving. That's how, and today's culture is completely different. We're under a take culture today. Now, when I say a giving culture, we had giveaways on this land. So for the Spokane Falls people, they invited or allowed other people to come get a share of the fish, to come get a share of the roots, come get a share of the berries. And so it was a sharing and giving culture. If you had a daughter that was going to be given away in marriage, we gave people that came our possessions. They were called giveaways. If it was a name ceremony, we gave our possessions away. We didn't take. If it was a memorial type thing, we have a giveaway, which like my, my wife is going to do this in, a, in about three weeks. We give our stuff away. Today's culture is a give take culture. If you have a birthday party, you take. If you have a wedding, you take. If you have other things, you, you're, you're expecting. So that's the difference between a, a sharing culture and a take culture. And, and a lot of that matches up, matched up with what Gary was preaching, the Ten Commandments. No other gods, no other images. Do not do, say the God's name in vain. You know, we, we didn't have a Sabbath, uh, so we kind of enjoyed that when that was incorporated. Uh, honor your mother and father, same as respecting your elders. You know, so a lot of things matched up, so we absorbed the, the Christian teachings when it did arrive. Now, there, there, was a, there is a, a little bit of a difference in, in um, how it all began. You know, for tribal people, our connection is close to animals. And we believe animals are all living things, are our brothers and sisters. And so how it began in our way is creator put the two-legged, the four-legged, the wings and everything in the water here upon earth. And then gave us the laws that we were to live by. But over time, some of the creatures could not live by those laws some some became too greedy some would steal some would do all these other things until there was only one standing and that was man and when there was one standing then creator put a heart into us and a mind into us one to feel and a mind to see in the future and then then it was our responsibility to take care of the earth and the land where we were placed and take care of the animals and the trees and the rivers and all of those things. And so that's, that's where the connection between animals and lands really come in. So I'm probably running on here. So I'm going to slow down and, and are there any questions that you, that come up on chat? Yeah. Janet asked a really good question earlier. Um, she asked the, about, um, I guess tribal membership. So when you live with another tribe, do you become part of that other tribe? Is that how, that's how sisters and brothers may belong to different tribes. So is, is a tribe more based upon where you live or you know what family you're part of? Well, that, that's a, a time frame question. So back when they were forced to move, say, to the Jocko, which is the Flathead, the Coeur d'Alene, the Colvilles, then when allotments come in and you received your land assignment, then he became a member of that tribe. So they are actually, those people are actually Colvilles and Coeur d'Alene's and Flatheads. Um, today, if, if I, my son marries a Kalispell, well, he's just a, a Spokane on the Kalispell reservation. And so the membership today, you stay the tribe that you were, that you were, um, that you were uh, um, enrolled with. And so there, there was a difference, and, and, but that's just a time. Today, it's you remain with the tribe that you enrolled. Now you can switch enrollments because a lot of people have so many different, um, they might be a full blood or three quarters, but they're still 
you know, so they could be actually enrolled with with a Spoka as a Spokane tribal member or a Calva member. But you could only you have to choose which one. You can't be dual enrolled. And so it, it's just based on the, that type of thing. Did that answer it? Thank you. Seems like it. She says, you know, tribal membership came with the land and now you stay with the tribe you're enrolled with. Very interesting. Thank you. I guess the question has to do with like it, your relationship to the land. I, I think that's interesting that, that initially it was determined by the land. So I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, and, and the sometimes it wasn't our choice because so for like you know it's like how we enter how tribal people were supposed to introduce ourselves well if i did it in the tribal way i would actually have introduced myself as um, telling you who my parents and my grandparents were and that was done that way in more respect out of the elders in the room the tribal elders because that told you really who I am as a person. So if I would have introduced myself in that, then if you were a tribal person, you would have knew, well, my mother's mother came, she was a lower Clark's Fork Indian of the Ponderé. And her father was a uh, Spokane Indian. And then on my, uh, my father's side, it would have told you my grandmother on that side was a Chwila Indian and my father, uh, grandfather on that side was a Kaval Indian. So it told you all these other things about me, but it also told you what kind of person I was. Or am I from a family of caring and sharing and giving people? Am I a family from uh, warriors? Am I a family from Christian believers or, or medicine people from, in the Indian way? And so it told much more about you and what part of the land you came from. Martin asks a question in the chat. Uh, does the Spokane tribe have a museum? If not, are Spokane materials saved and, and displayed elsewhere? Uh, we don't have a, and it's sad to say this, but we don't have a formal museum. Um, some of the stuff that that is available is, is I open my office up to, to groups and, and just individuals and share because I, I have a lot of those types of things that you would find in museums. Uh, but we do have a archives. Uh, a lot of our stuff is, is at the Museum of Arts and Culture, the MAC in the city of Spokane. Uh, we do have a repository here in Walpinit, um, but it, it's a, not, readily accessible. It's not set up in the museum fashion. Um, so if you wanted to see that stuff, you, you'd either have to go through myself or someone like me that, that could show you the stuff and talk about it if, if it was how the bags are made or the tools are made or any of that type of stuff. Yeah, that, that's a sad story of, of itself <laughs> that we don't have that, that type of uh, museum. Anything else? Yes. I have another question about the land acknowledgement itself. I think the first time I heard one was um, when I moved to Spokane about four years ago and a tribal member, as we might gather and talk about, you know, any number of community issues would do this land acknowledgement. And, and I wondered if, if that's, is that a traditional practice, kind of like an invocation that has always been part of the practice or does it have more emphasis now because we have become so disconnected from creation? I, I was wondering what the origin was. But, um, you know, you, typically when the tribe opened up a meeting of any sort, it was done with prayer and it was done in a fashion where you thanked creator and you thanked what it brought and all of that was on the land. So there is a prayer, um, I'm not sure if I put it in here, and it talks about thanking creator for the waters that come, comes from the mountain and fills our rivers. And it, it's, 
it's there is a land connection because there's always a land connection in everything around us. The and land actually high market. The, the modern day uh, land acknowledgement was just trying to help us remember history. Well, and remember right. who is on the land here first. Um, and that that is that's been building over about the last 12 years. The first one I I really played a role of was about 12 years ago. I think it was I think it was Eastern Washington University as we were trying to uh, create a relationship with that university. They they took one of the first steps. At least that I'm that I'm aware of. Anything else, Edwin, on your chat? I think that's it for now. We might have more discussion later. Okay, J just to clarify, how much time? How much more do you want? We still have up to you know perhaps um, I'm thinking about up to forty minutes okay. uh, left in this in this. Excuse me, I'm I'm twenty minutes. My apologies. Uh, we have about twenty minutes left in this session. Okay. Um, so I kind of already touched on the sharing and giving of, of that's who we were. And that was important, very important to us because we understood the tribes around us could not exist without the things on our land. And we couldn't exist on do the things on their land. And so it had a reciprocal sharing and giving uh, agreements. Now, as I pointed out, this, this is the 1880 version of Riverfront Park. So this this is what was here before. This is during the, the heavy fishing seasons. There's fishing time. Now in 1974, and I'll date myself a little bit, 1974 in the city of Spokane was, was the World's Fair. Now on the as Expo was being unfolded and they invited all these countries from around the world to share their, their cultures. In the latter part of that, somebody's light bulb come on and, and said, well, I think we're missing a culture. Maybe we should approach the tribes and have them play a role in, in this World's Fair. And so there was some meetings and there were, they, they invited the Spokanes and the Coeur d'Alene's and the Colvilles and we met trying to put something together for the World's Fair and they kind of put us on the back lot. Um, and a lot of our display was a still two by fours and ply board. I don't know if it was painted, but I don't recall it being painted. But anyway, at one of those meetings, today it's the, um, used to be the, it's Anthony's restaurant. So after the meeting, the gentleman stepped out on the balcony and overlooking the falls. And these are some of the words came from our, our chairman, Alex Sherwood. And he was, he played a role in our council for about 27 years. And it, it this is just a part of that. And right below where we are standing, Indians from all over would gather every year for the annual salmon fishery. You could hear the shouting welcomes as they arrived, the trading, the games, the races, and always the hearty hugs and the fish so thick they filled the river. But just to emphasize the Spokane Falls, its importance as a gathering spot. It brought tribes together from, from all over the region uh, Coeur d'Alene's and Kalispells and Ponderays and Sand Poils and, and Palouse Indians would, would come here to get a share of the fish. And so the city was, is built on um, you know, ancestral grounds that were very, very important to the tribes living and success. Now this is another photo I'll just throw at you. Um, this is the lower part of the Spokane. This is the Spokane River where it used to empty, or still does, empties into the Columbia River. So this is what we call two rivers. The Spokane Reservation is in the, the top part. The Colville Reservation is just out of the picture to the right. And then Lincoln County towards Davenport is, is, on, the, is on the right. I'm sorry, Colville Tribe is on the left. Um, but this is the amount of water that due to Grand Coulee Dam has flooded. So it took away a lot of the farms and the, the different areas that, that used to be the tribal people or when they were forced to get into farming and started building their farms and building their schools and building their towns and churches along the river, then they said, you have to move. 
And so the, this occurred farther downstream. This is another river valley uh, up in between the city of Spokane and the, the two rivers I just showed you. Another river valley, same thing occurred. The arrow on the left, that's actually where the Spokane River Presbyterian Church was for the tribe. Um, that originally Deep Creek and then was moved out here when we were forced out of the city of Spokane. But you can see in these three photos, the, the same mountain in the background, pre the one in the top left is, is pre Cooley Dam. They came and cleared the trees on the right and then the bottom is what we have. It's a beautiful lake today, but it used to be a beautiful river valley. You know, the, the, like I said, the, the church, the homes, the orchards, the farm grounds, they were all flooded over by Grand backwaters of Grand Coulee Dam. If you want to see a little bit more of this, there is, if you look up my name on, on YouTube, it'll help you tell that story. You know, we were a horse culture. Um, it all began when the first non-Indian arrived in 1810. And I kind of gave a little bit of that story with, with Chief Spokane Gary and going away and coming back. Now the rest of the history, um, I, I don't know if I'll venture into, because uh, it's in my actual lo longer version of the, the PowerPoints that I do around the region. And it talks more about the, the genocide and the cultural genocide and all these things that the people that lived on this land had to go through, uh, but in a way it still shows our resilience, you know, because back in the 1800s, they thought it there'd be at one time no more tribes. They'd just be stuff of history, uh, but, but we are still here, you know, but it's a lot of that came in our faith though, not just our tribal faith, but our Christian faith. And, and so those helped us, helped us through that. You know, and then the history of the priests and missionaries. Um, again, I, the first one was was Chief Gary. The sec, the per, first Protestants, was close to the reservation. That was the Shimakan Mission. Um, they were here for only nine years. Um, but but there's another story there. War for the tribe in the city of Spokane. War arrived in the 1850s, beginning with the Yakima Wars down south. Uh, but it was all began with with the doctrine of discovery and man, and then in, for this country manifest destiny. So in our telling of it, or I'll say in my telling of it, manifest destiny based on the doctrine was uh, the non-Indian was destined, told that they were destined to own everything on the North American continent, no matter what. And this photo kind of shows that of pushing the tribes out, pushing the buffalo out, and that that tells the story. Well, in the doctrine of discovery, it says if you're not Christian, you cannot own land. If you're not Christian, you're less than a human being. If you're not Christian, all these other things, and that was adopted by Thomas Jefferson, created in the Manifest Destiny, and, and then that's kind of what put us on the 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 path of our history that came about. 1850s, we understood our world was closing in. Oregon Territory was developed, wagon loads of people flooded in. 1849, the gold rush down south, then gold is found in the Colville Valley and in Canada, and then ships of people are landing in, in, in Seattle. So our world it was shrinking and they were getting closer and closer and closer until war finally broke out with the Yakimas. And then war came to the city of Spokane in the 1858. Springtime, it was Steptoe down towards Rosalia. They came out of Walla Walla. A, a battle, did, the Steptoe battle took place. And, at, and during this one, the, the tribes were actually the victors, one of the few victories that we could ever really say it was actually a Coeur d'Alene battle that the, the Spokanes and the Yakimas came and aided in and drove the soldiers out. But then they, they, we had them surrounded. And if it wasn't for the priest of the Coeur d'Alene's, Father Josette, convincing the uh, Coeur d'Alene's because they were very devout Christians, they were Catholic, without him interceding, those 147 soldiers would all have been wiped out. 
and it would have been on the magnitude because this was before some of the larger it would have been in the history books more like uh, uh, the Battle of the Little Bighorn and Crazy Horse. But because of the, the priest convincing them just to let them get away and go home, it's not in the history books. So you don't hear about this story very often. But then they returned and wiped us out. They brought a new weapon. The old weapons were bows and arrows and a musket, each shooting about 50 yards. Now they brought a new weapon, the, the rifle, or the musket rifle. Now they can not just shoot 50 yards, but 500. And so in the battles of the Four Lakes, which is out towards Cheney, so the next time you go to Cheney or towards Seattle, at the turnoff to go to Cheney off the freeway, if you look to your right, I think there's some grain bins out there now. Well, that's the Four Lakes battlefield. And it wasn't much of a battle. We couldn't get close enough to kill a single soldier. And so when we we're trying to defend family and country and our way of life, we didn't stand much of a chance. And then a few days later was the fire on the plains. Now the fire on the plains went from across Fairchild, across Airway Heights, and ended just on the other side of what is today's um, Northern Quest Casino. And that was the end of the fighting. We realized there was nothing we could do. Again, uh, two battles, two day long battles and we didn't kill a single soldier, you know, and tribal people were, were giving up their lives to defend family and country in, in our way of life, though. This is kind of the route. Then there's the sad story of horse slaughter, and they killed 970 horses and, you know, the, to punish us and other things. Um, and there, there are, again, YouTube, if you want a little more about that history. If you look up my name and on YouTube, there's, there's um, you can find it. I did, I created some videos for that, some for teachers, and, and there's one documentary. But our, our, our stuff, our life began to erode after the signing of that treaty forced by right. Now that uh, we talked earlier about the salmon and how important that was. Well, all of a sudden the salmon started getting less and less and less. Chief Gary actually wrote a letter to the Indian agent and said, can you tell the tribes down south to quit fishing so hard? My people are starving. And most people think it was the dams that created the first destruction of the salmon fishery and it wasn't. It was these fish wheels. Night and day, these things are turning down towards Portland and Astoria. Night and day, hundreds, hundreds, thousands and thousands of fish were coming out. And they there was these huge canneries on the lower part of the Cumbria, and they were just taking everything out of the river. The fish that used to feed the Spokans and Kalispells and Coeur d'Alene's and San Poils and the Spelums and Yakimas and Nez Perce were no longer coming because they were taking all the fish, canning it, and then sending it around the world. And so the tribal people's way of life was being forced to change. We had, we had to then had to start, okay, what is this thing called farming and take to that through the reservation era. So just magnitude, the year Chief Lot, we talked about Chief Lot signing for the reservation. Well, the year he signed for the reservation, there were 35 million pounds of fish coming out. And that's just part of the, now the tribal person eats the whole fish, fish head and everything. Well, they canned about 80%. So you add 25, 20, 25%. So instead of 40 million pounds of fish, it was probably more like 50 or 55 million pounds of fish taken out of the river every year. And remember, a, a salmon goes in between two and a five year cycle. So after you do this for a couple generations, the fish begin to go away and the, the Indians start to starve that we're trying to live off of fish. The other food source, sometimes we went to other parts of the continent. We did go to hunt buffalo in Montana. It was after the coming of the horse, we went twice a year, left in the spring, returned in the fall, or left in the fall and returned in the spring. We cycled that through to, to get the red meat and the heavy hides coming back home to make our families uh, uh, warmer and more comfortable. But then that disappeared. You know, the, a lot of the history is not, again, we talk about the history of the land. So when you talk about Spokane history and the lands we used, that extends over into Montana because we, we used the animals that was on that land. 
Now, I don't know if this is taught in history books anymore, but there used to be millions and millions of buffalo on the reservation. There was a, the buffalo was a staff of life to the plains, just like salmon was a staff of life to the Spokans. That was their major food source and the salmon was ours. Well, by 1878, all the buffalo in the south were gone. By 1883, all the buffalo in the north were gone. All but about 500 out of 30 to 60 million, they wiped them down to about 500. Most of it was done through buffalo trains. You'd find along the train tracks these mountains of buffalo skulls or just hides that were being sent to the leather factories. But these buffalo skulls, they come in hedgerows or just mountains. The reason they use the buffalo skulls is because it's almost all bone. They sent the, the, that to factories to be made into fertilizer. And so that's how they wiped out the buffalo. But also that was an intentional because Philip Sheridan who later became more known in the Civil War. You kill the buffalo, you kill the Indians. And so it was an, in, uh, an intentional process to, to force the tribal people to the reservations because you can't force Spokane's or you can't force Blackfeet to the reservation with promises of food if they already have all the food they ever needed. They have all the buffalo, they have all the salmon. Well, you can't force them to the reservation and say, I'll give you plows and plows and horses if you to grow your own food if you already have all the food you have. So those things went had to go away. Then for the city, back to the city of Spokane and the land acknowledgement here. You know. By 1884, people that was growing up around us, we were born forced to the reservation or forced off the lands, forced away from our falls, from the river. You know, and there are some stories of tribal people starting farms and then being pushed off because they didn't have the money to file a fee patent for the land. And so Gary and others were forced out of their farms, even though they built the home and the barns and had it in crop, they were forced away. And then come the reservation era, they're they trying to make fishers into farmers, handing us a bag of seeds and a plow and, and forcing it that way. Now, the last one I'm going to, now for the reservation, when I talked about lot creating the reservation, was a very uh, noted chief from our point of view. You know, his, his big thing was education. He understood, again, just like Chief Gary's father did, Chief Lott understood people are coming. You need to learn the people that are coming if you're going to live amongst them or try to communicate with them. So he wanted a school here on the reservation really bad. And he worked his whole life to try to attain a, a, a school here on the reservation. And so getting none, though, after years and years of trying to get a, a school built, he went to DC and pleaded his case. He wrote letters and, and he just wasn't getting anywhere. He actually went to DC and he was promised a school. He went with Tenasket and another chief, uh, Moses, and was promised a school. But when he returned, none was built. One was built for each of those other chiefs, but not for him. So the government came back in and said, well, give us your children and we'll take them to Oregon and teach them there and then they'll send them back to you. Similar to what they do to Gary, take him away. Well, the unfortunate part of the 23 kids um, that were sent, only five returned, everybody else died of disease down, down in Oregon. And the five that returned died of disease and carried the disease back. And so that was his education experience until a Christian group out of Rhode Island heard his one of his speeches. And I'll end with this, but when they heard the speeches, they raised the funds, hired Helen Clark out of Canada and brought the first schoolhouse to Wolpenit. And that was in 1894. There's more, but my time's up. I'm gonna open back up for questions. I will. Thank you, Warren, very much. We have some good questions, lots of good questions. Uh, Karen Stahl asks, what month did the salmon uh, come to Spokane and when was the salmon festival? So there were, there were four species, three salmon and then the steelhead. So they would be beginning. So in, just about three weeks ago, 
we were given notice the salmon were leaving the ocean and entering the Columbia. And who gave, gives us notice is the morning dove. So when the morning dove starts making its call, um, you can hear it in, in Spokane if you listen, because it, it goes, um, excuse me, I'm going to whistle Do it. Do it. So when you hear that as a tribal person, that's telling you salmon are entering, leaving the ocean, entering the waters to return. And then it's about 45 days. So mid-June through June is when those big June hogs arrive. Then there was a, and that's the, the spring run. Then there was a late spring run and then the summer run and then a fall run. So those, those species of fish come at different times. And so the, the steelhead goes into the Little Spokane or the, the Chinook. Um, and so there was four species. So it went from June through August and September, just a different species during that period of time. Thank you. Um, I, I want a, a comment and then maybe a question. I really appreciate that you brought up the doctrine of discovery because it is a Christian doctrine that was used for political ends. And I just want to take a moment. The ELCA, our denomination, has expressly rejected uh, the doctrine of discovery um, and uh, wanted to mention that to the group. That's something that maybe we're not very uh, might be familiar with. I wasn't particularly familiar with until I learned that we were we were voting to reject it, uh, and appreciate that. Uh, to follow up on this, Janet asks a question. Uh, I'm interested. Uh, am I to understand the manifest destiny pressure uh, stirred up warring against settlers and between tribes as well, or did the tribes unite uh, in defending against the settlers? Oh, good question. So when in the eight, late 1840s, early 1850s, there was a, in the root grounds, the root grounds, the brown camas root grounds, there were, they, those were around Turnbull, which is just around Cheney, and in that medical lake area. Prior to the war that occurred in the city of Spokane, when, those, when the first non-Indians were arriving, they wondered, well, why, why are these not tribes not like those back east? Because those back east fight amongst themselves. Those tribes battle and, and kill each other. They have wars against each other. But these Indians in the Pacific Northwest, they don't do that to that extent. Well, what occurred in those root fields, there was a before the Yakima Wars began, there was a big gathering in those root fields. There were Spokanes and Coeur d'Alene's and Okanagans and uh, Nespelums, and they all arrived and they, they joined in, in this big council, the chiefs met. And so they talked about the squabbles or minor fighting they had amongst each other. And they said, that is not helping us. You win for a while, and then I retaliate and you lose. I win for a while, then you retaliate and I lose. And so how are we gonna resolve this? Well, what occurred was there was a marriage, a marriage between Chief Palatkin, who was on Lower Spokane down, down towards the confluence of the Spokane and the, the Columbia Rivers, and the Yakima war leader, Qualchin, who Qualchin Golf Course in the city of Spokane is named after. He was a, a fierce warrior. Well, they married the Yakima warrior and the Spokane woman, Whistox, which you might have seen in the newspaper, Whistox Way, trying to replace that with Fort George Wright Drive by Spokane Falls Community College. Well, when they united, that united all of the area tribes. And so these, for the very first time, the, the Sahaptan speakers, who are the, the Yakimas and Palouse and Nez Perce and the Salish speakers, the ones we talked about, came together, um, other than the Nez Perce, the Nez Perce sided with the military all the time, but, but they, they did unite. Very interesting, thank you. 
Uh, Connie Payne is a teacher at Grant Elementary School. They use a land acknowledgement as part of their morning announcements. Uh, recently, she got into a discussion with a coworker who felt that this was not right. The coworker said, I'm not one of the ones who displaced the natives. Why are we bringing this up? Uh, and I guess maybe the question is, how, what's your perspective on how to respond to folks who find this challenging, the, the contrast between an acknowledgement and sometimes this feels a, accusatory, an accusation. Can you speak a little bit maybe to that? Um, I would have to say, well, why do you want to not acknowledge history? You know, especially if you're a Christian, would that say you're, you're all of the history between that, that backs the Christian beliefs is not to be talked about or discussed? You know, or do you want to not talk about slavery? Do you not want to talk about the Jewish Holocaust? Do you not want to talk about, you know, um, American forefathers, the presidents? Well, mm -hmm. that's history and you talk about it because it's, it's good to remember what it was. And it's, it's not to be taken in an accusation towards anyone. And they, you know, hopefully they wouldn't receive it that way but it's just talking about the history of the land. It's, you know, and that's, that should always, you know, I, I have a, had a conversation lately with a person and they were excited to tell me about uh, my, my forefathers. And they talked about, we've been here for four generations on this farm. You know, my great, great, great grandfather started this farm. And they too had that kind of conversation or, thinking that you just mentioned. And so I said, well, you're excited about your four generations of owning that farm. Well, I have a thousand generations of owning that land. Now, why is that a difference? You know, it's, it's just to a different magnitude. This brings us to a, another place. Uh, Neil Buckler made a really good comment earlier, which is that one of the cultural challenges, one of the historical challenges has been between a, a European model of land ownership and a native Indian perspective of nobody really owns the land, we steward the land, we are caretakers of the land uh, and, and experiencing you know, that conflict. Um, and, and one of the things that I reflected on from your conversation is just the way in which it just is, is continual almost in the history of the tribe that land was taken and then land was flooded and then the way of life was changed. And it is this intergenerational experience of trauma that we are sort of um, attempting to acknowledge today and, and live in solidarity with you, our brothers and sisters, who, who we now share this land with. Other questions from the group? So I, I, I did click on my chat box. Um, there's something that says Salmon Return Festival each spring is wonderful. Are they talking about the Kettle Falls salmon ceremony? Is that the, what they're referring to? Here. It was by Martin Wells. Yeah, Martin, was that is that what you're talking about? Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. It's been really fun to go there. So you've attended up at up at Kettle Falls. Yeah, yeah, they the Kaval tribe does a, a a wonderful um, ceremony, you know, calling the salmon home is yes. the intent. Um, and that, that's, the tribes are, are really doing just more modern day stuff. The tribes are doing great leaps and bounds of trying to get salmon back in to above Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee. And just to share a story with you, um, the Spokane tribe is, is doing the same. And when people say, well, that will never be, the tribe has always said, they know the way home. They know how to get home because Crater has put something in their being that mm -hmm. brings them back to the, where they were born every year mm -hmm. or when it's time to come home. And we, we've tested that. So about five years ago, 
Um, the federal government didn't want us to do this, but we did it anyway. So we, I can't say where we got the salmon eggs from to, to spawn out, but we put some in the creeks of the reservation, Shimakan Creek. We talked about Shimakan Mission, that, that creek. And just, just little tiny fish, we raised them and turned them out. And then, you know, and then you put a pit tag in it. So it's, it, when it goes, if it goes past certain dams, it'll ping, you know. So we, we only had 700. So you imagine, you know, the tens of millions of eggs, hundreds million eggs that were spawned historically, 700 doesn't sound like, well, that's not much of a chance because one salmon will, will produce a million eggs. And so putting 500, well, it's a chance. Let's just see. And then they, so they went, put them in Shimakan. And then about four weeks to a month later, ping, way downstream towards Bonneville and the Dalles Dams down on the Columbia, ping. And we, our guys get a phone call. Well, what's, what's a Shimakan fish? <laughs> then we kind of had come, well, we put these, turned these fish loose. We didn't say they were salmon. And then we just hoping one would make it to the ocean, ping. And then after two years, we kind of forgot about it. We, it, you know, to the, to us that was a success. It it went to the ocean because salmon go on a four thousand mile journey to return back home. Well, two years later, when we thought, well, you know, eh, maybe at least they made it to the ocean. But then two years later, ping, past the Dells, ping, past bon bon Bonneville, something was trying to come home. And so our boss called the Colville tribe who actually collects salmon eggs to be raised in the hatchery at Chief Joseph Dam. And he calls, if there's just a miraculous chance, you hear this fish, can you send it back our way as you're collecting for salmon eggs? And, you know, we didn't think it'd be possible. Then on the last day, they're fishing to catch eggs, salmon to spawn out for eggs. He calls our op office and says, BJ, sorry. At least we know it was in the system. It was trying to come home. And, and you know, we're, we're closing our raceways. We're cleaning out our capture areas and, you know, but we tried. He gets a phone call the next day. BJ, I, we don't know what happened because we closed the gates. We came to work and there were 10 fish in our raceways. Do you want them? Well, <laughs> at first he didn't say what they caught, but in the conversation, he says, you know, one of those has this tag. It's got 007 in it. It's your fish. And so it made that 4,000 mile journey. It was trying to come home. And so we've done that in a second year. So we know they'll return if given that opportunity. And so it, it was, it was pretty, to us, it was pretty miraculous because for it, for actually there was two fish that returned that year. So. Anything uh, else? Yeah, Neil or Tina commented in the chat that when the Elwood Dam was removed, that there was a very rapid recovery um, there, um, quite surprising. So it, it really speaks to that perspective that you share with us, Warren, that Creator has put something uh, in, in, uh, in these creatures to you know, know how to come home. Uh, Janet asks, does the Spokane tribe have any particular point of view on the proposed dam removal on the Snake River, or broader, just brought more broadly speaking on how we can help stimulate uh, salmon populations. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we, we support the dam removal, but we do have concerns <clears throat> about what happens if they do. We, we're, we try to get a a jump start. We have some wonderful fish biologists and scientists. And so we're because of Grand Coulee Dam. Grand Coulee Dam is, is really what they call the crown jewel of the federal water system. It controls everything. It controls barging and irrigation and salmon recovery 
and all you know all these things and it, they always come back to Cooley Dam which floods our reservation when they want to fix something so the concern is or the question is if they remove those other dams how much more are they going to come and ask for the Spokane tribe because the bigger area for um for fish is is above Grand Coulee so we're kind of pushing to say well if you can do that at those dams put some money into getting fish past chief you don't have to take them out but it'll get them past chief joseph and grand coulee don't just think it's this is a lower river issue because it, it's throughout the system because the most habitat is above grand coulee and it's been proven i mean there's more up here for and which would contribute to the whole region if you can get fish back up here in those those larger habitats yeah we support it we uh matter of fact last week there was a meeting down in boise on it and uh, so they're trying to investigate it and, and flush all those questions and come up with more of the scientific answers to everything. Gail asked a question about the history of the missionary movement uh, that in central Idaho, there was an agreement that one denomination would establish uh, uh, a mission maybe in one town or settlement and another in the next. So we kind of uh, divvied up the territory. You mentioned uh, Presbyterians on Spokane land. Uh, do you know of any others or any other such uh, a similar kind of agreement among missionaries as they came into this area? There up here, there was no agreements. They actually fought for the followers. They actually competed and they, they would, they would ridicule the other church. So, and that's kind of what, why Gary, when he went away and started teaching and preaching back here, he got out of the, out of that because he, what, in his words, they jawed me too much. See, his uncle was a Coeur d'Alene. Chief Celtis was his uncle. Well, they were very devout Catholics. He was taught in the Protestant teaching. And so when he taught, he taught it as a Protestant. And so the Coeur d'Alene's would mimic or, or um, challenge him. And they, he would say, the Coeur d'Alene's who were Catholic would say, oh, that's not even a religion. And so then they, they actually fought over that. And if you take Chief Joseph, who wasn't a reservation as per Indian or reservation Indian. He, he's the one that wanted to stay in Wallawa Valley. When they asked Joseph, uh, Joseph, do you want a school? And he said, no. Do you want a church? And he said, no. And they come back over the top of that and said, well, Joseph, why do you not want a church? And his response was, because it'll cause us to fight like they do on the Nez Perce reservation where the, the Methodists and the, the uh, Protestants and the Catholics, they fought. Um, and in his words, if I can recall some um, paraphrasing, but we can argue about things of man, but you do not argue about the creator. And that's what those churches are doing. They, the, they were creating controversy over God and he didn't want that and so he thought if he had a church that would create that for his people and he, he just saw it was tearing away at him you know when when uh, father Desmet um, or is it this one that founded Gonzaga um, yeah it was Desmet wasn't it when, when Gonzaga was founded at first it was, the land was purchased for an Indian school in 1887, I think it was 87. Then the city of Spokane convinced them to change it to a university so they'd bring all the best minds from around the Pacific Northwest to the city of Spokane. Well, then the Spokane tribe and who was promised the school was, was pushed out of, the, out of the site for a school. But it was that um, difference in his struggle was he thought the tribal people would turn Methodist and not remain Catholic. And so there were those struggles between the churches, um, various different, on the reservation we had, we have Presbyterians and Catholics and Assembly of God. 
Well, we have our, certainly we are not immune to any of the history of human conflict. And certainly our faith has been used against other members of our own faith too. Uh, and I guess part of what I appreciate today is that it's about acknowledging our history, not just the, the land and the people of this land, but the history of the land. Uh, and the blessings of that history and the challenges, the things that we can learn from um, and the things that maybe um, we can grow from. So Warren, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. We're really happy to have you. Uh, thank you to you and to the Spokane Tribe of Indians for uh, this time. And we're happy to call you our neighbor. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, I will actually go through the chat if you and answer anything um, that I think I can. Oh, uh, someone said Cataldo was Gonzaga. Yeah, Joseph Cataldo, that's correct. Um, so thank you. Um, but I, I do want to say with, in, in closing, you know, grandma, my, my yaya, my grandmother, um, always, she, she always made sure to tell us that um, there was still one God. If you call it creator or whatever you call it, there's still just one God. You know, people might pray to him or thank him in different ways, but there's still only one. And that was her belief. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today.